so uh, last talk of this session, we have uh, Joachim. Did, did I get even close? Very good. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm still working on it. Uh, and we have a demo for this one, uh, which is uh, Kaleidovine. Yeah, thank you. All right, um, welcome to my first appearance at Farm. It's, it's nice to go from the more serious things to, to this thing. Um, <laughs> It's a demo. I think this means that I can just talk about something that I created for fun and I like, and I hope you like it as well. And if, if not, then so there's not going to be much deep research or very interesting insights here, I expect. But maybe oh, we'll see. So how did this all start? This actually started um, here, so um, Zurich uh, last year. Um, Zurich is a very nice Haskell convention thing in, in Zurich. It's uh, beautiful. You can go swimming, um, and it's very nice environment to have crazy ideas. So I was actually sitting with Christina, who you just saw. Yeah, on uh, this photo. Oh, are you actually there? Yeah, I'm that's sitting <laughs> Yeah, that's me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, and, and we were brainstorming an interesting question. I found that when I had a, like a full day of serious, like serious work, you know, the ICFP kind of work, um, at the end of the day, my brain is still kind of on high gear. And I kind of want to calm down. Um, and not continue thinking about the, the work set that I just did. And I was wondering what kind of computer game would help that. Because many games, um, and also other stuff like watching TV, it's not enough to like capture your brain. So you do some mechanical things, or you watch Game of Thrones, but it, like, there's plenty of brain left to keep thinking about what you're thinking about. So that, that wasn't quite it. And of course, you could also do something like a first-person shooter um, that's really going to require your full attention and this will push everything you're thinking about out of your brain but it's not going to be relaxing and we were thinking about what could what could do something like this and out of this brainstorming this little game collide again was created and I'm not saying that it's solving this problem at all um, <laughs> just a little bit but maybe it gives you some intuition of why I started thinking about this problem so let's see um, what does this game look like it's um, you can run it in the browser um, and it presents you with this UI. And it's always fun to give it to people and see if they can figure out the UI on, on their own. And some people do, and some people don't. Um, so I'll, I'll spare you this. I'll just show you what you can do. It, you can't do much. You cannot, down there, you have a selection of um, colorful patterns. And you can select two. Two are already selected. But you can also select other two. And um, it combines these two in some way that is, um, or these should be actually be spheres. So I don't know what's happening here. Um, and, and if you like what you see, so maybe you like this one actually, uh, you can add it to your collection. And then you can go on. <laughs> so, and and um, a as they accumulate more, um, more aspects to, to how the shape is, they, they get more interesting. Um, so, let me do a few more. Just, I mean, this is random. I don't know what's happening. Um, I'm just clicking on the ones that I like. Um, no, maybe. Yeah, that's not actually good. Let's try with this one. And Combine it with one of these more complicated ones. Actually, maybe I want some red. Yes, this is this is nice. Um, and you can keep going like this, and that's all. You've seen the complete action. Well, um, so there's there's no time limit, there's no score, there's no goal. Some people say it's in a game, it's a toy. For those people who like to make a distinction between games and toys, um, you can click. Those of it's, it's interesting if you give it to people, um, people my age and older, they start like clicking on things. Um, people at Ergo start like using their finger and then they they like do this thing. Um, so it, it also works. You can you can just use drag and drop to, to do this thing and actually it's more efficient. So maybe maybe the young people have something on, on us here. Um, right. And and that's um, everything is to be said about what's happening on the surface of the game. Um, oh you can also I guess you can also um, if you have OCD you can clean up so that it doesn't grow too much. There's no limit on how much you can have there, it just gets smaller and smaller. And you can, if you like something really, you can save it as a PNG, um, as a file, and then, I don't know, print it on a mark or something. All right, so that's um, Canonical in Action. I guess you're more interested now in um, what's happening behind the scenes. So, um, I've created a small, um, like, behind the scene, cheating thingy. Um, so the, the name already gives you a hint. It's Kaleido Gen, like it's in genetics. 
Um, the whole thing is structured based on a very rough inspiration from biology. So each of these patterns have a genome, and because we're computer scientists, the genome is a sequence of bytes. Any sequence of bytes is a, is a genome. And then I can um, turn this into a pattern, so it's a genome expression, so to say. And the, f the way it works is that the first two bytes um, encode two colors. Um, so uh, we start with one color here. Um, and then the next byte, or the next byte, encode the way you combine these colors to form more and more complicated things. So let's see, we can, um, um, there's one way of combining them that's just a, a checker pattern. There's um, what I call the, the fan, so the sp um, spherical segments. There's a transition, where you just do a, a gradient from one color to the other from the inside out. And there is, oh wait, this is, three, um, and you can put one on top of the other. So there are four ways of combining two shapes. Um, the, the high level is the level is half a byte. Uh, the high level is which kind of transition you want to do. The second one is the parameter for those who have parameters, so we can have different sizes here. This is maybe more interesting for maybe the checkerboard, so you can have large or small um, checkboard um, tiles. And there's four more. Um, so for these, let me create the the checkboard, and then um, okay, and then, then there are four more that do not combine two patterns, but just modify one. Um, and the one we see here um, is rotation, and then we have um, this is my favorite one: inversion. Take everything from the inside, from the outside to the inside, and, and back. And this turns something boring like a um, checkup pattern into something very fancy. Um, we have the little dilution, um, the dil not a dilution, what's the Distortion. Again? Distortion, dilation. Dilation. Dil dilation. Dilation, thank you. Some dilation thingy. And, um, and this is kind of, this, this, a friend of mine gave me that. This is really, um, really a bit odd. It, it um, basically takes segments and squeezes some segments and expands some segments. So it's, well, something happening. It doesn't really matter what's <laughs> happening. Um, so we have these building blocks, and then all we need to do is, so to say, is we, we take the, the byte string that's up there, so we make it a bit longer. Um, uh, seven, seven exists as a hex number. Um, yeah, this looks nice. Um, and turn it into a tree, and the way you turn it into a tree is essentially um, a look at the first byte. Is it a, one of the binary operations or the unary operations? Is it one of the unary ones? Um, all the rest encodes the argument if it's a binary one. I split it in the middle, which gives nicely balanced trees. And um, this may go all the way down until I'm at the leaf. A leaf is then filled with one of these two colors. So currently it's blue and red. And you might notice it's not just two colors here. So what I do when I have more than one leaf at the end is I do some little shades. So I'm a little bit brighter, a little bit darker, a little bit further left or right on the color wheel, just to put some variation in there. It used to be that you could have arbitrary many colors in one of these things, but that didn't, didn't work quite, a, quite out so well. It was too colorful, too, too thick. And seeing two colors plus a bit of shades is a good start. And we can actually see what's happening here. Um, so this is the kind of, and sorry for the back, this is um, one, I guess. Um, this is basically the expression to that does this thing. All right, so that's sheet expression. That's how I come up with random rules for turning a, a byte string into um, a pattern. The other thing that we need to know is how to actually crossbreed two of these patterns. And you can see that as well. Um, a little bit smaller again. Um, in this little helpful demo view. So yeah, I have two patterns. Um, and this one is the, the cross combination. And again, the first two bytes are the colors. I'm treating them separately. I feel kind of bad for doing that because I would like it to be m more generic, but it seems that if you do too much random stuff with colors, it's just, you know, colors change randomly. That's, that's not nice. So but it, for the colors, it's very simple. I, I pick one color uh, randomly from the left parent and one color randomly from the right parent. I, I guess it's all around here. Um, so let's see. Let's add color two here. Okay, now I'm picking two from here and zero from there. 
And then what the rest is doing is it's taking the two, um, the remainder of the two genomes as bytes, <coughs> concatenates them, and there's a little bit of mutation happening. So maybe I'm adding something in the front, and maybe I'm removing some random bytes right out of the middle. And I'm more likely to add something in the front if the genome is short. I'm more likely to remove stuff when it's long so that it doesn't grow exponentially with every step you're taking. Um, and that's it for the genome, for the, the, the crossing. And I guess the, the main interesting point here is that I'm intentionally working on different layers of abstraction. So for the expression, I'm taking the, the byte string and turning it a tree um, in a very um, straightforward way, doing this kind of um, binary separation of, the, of this, these bytes. And then I'm turning the tree into a picture. And you could imagine that you want to kind of merge these two trees. You know, take um, to merge two trees, you could either take the left from this one and the right from that one, or you could somehow balance them together. And I had this initially, but it didn't quite work so well. Like it was either too, it was too restrictive. And by having the the genomes being crossbred on on a lower level abstraction, I can break the abstraction and I can take the trees apart and reassemble them in different ways. And I think this adds to the. Um, this helps to achieve this, or try to achieve this aim that you can't really predict what's happening, but whenever you do a, a combination of two, um, of two here, then the result is at least um, a plausible result of as a descendant of these two patterns. Um, all right, so this is the, um, so to say, the, the game logic, um, and. Because this is uh, this farm and there's Haskell stuff going on, um, I want to say at least a little bit about the implementation. Um, so I'm a Haskell guy. Uh, this was done at Haskell, um, uh, Siri Hex. So obviously, it's written in Haskell. Um, it's written in Haskell. It's compiled to JavaScript using GHHS, which is this compiler that compiles Haskell to JavaScript. And it's actually quite usable. Um, initially, I had also Haskell code that was drawing these pictures. You know, using for each pixel, calculate the color. That didn't work out so quite well. So what I'm doing instead now is I'm using Haskell for what it's good for, namely compiling languages. So I'm um, I'm taking uh, this tree and I'm turning it into WebGL shader code, which looks like this. And then I'm running this on the um, using the normal WebGL um, uh, stuff. So it's actually the graphic card that's rendering this thing, and this is um, much faster. So on, on a laptop, all these are being rendered in every frame, and it's, it's fast enough um, to, to be usable. On mobile, if, if you have several dozens of these, then it gets a bit slower. Still have to do some profiling there, um, but it seems to be hard to find out how to profile JavaScript that was compiled from Haskell. It's using WebGL in a way to actually learn something useful. Um, Right, because it's all WebGL, well, it was actually pretty easy to get rid of all the JavaScript stuff and just write a native application that's using SDL, which is this um, compatibility layoff over <coughs> basic hardware, and then use OpenGL for the rendering, and the same code more or less works in both cases. So that's nice. Um, we just had a talk from someone who comes from a company that does FRP and has ideas about structuring games. Um, I tried to implement this with FRP before, first, so I was using Reflex. Uh, Reflex is this commercially used FRP library that is very good at building web UIs and, and impressive ones. And I really would, would have liked to use it, and I used it initially, and it was super nice as long as the output of the, the thing you see is more or less a function of the current state of the game. But this is not the case here. I mean, it's no longer the case. It was the case initially, but now we have things like, um, if I change the size of the window, you'll see that it, um, it readjusts the way it, it aligns these. And it's an animation. So the, the display is, is not just a function of the game state, or even a function of the game state plus the size of the window, but also the history of all these things. Or if I, um, if I select one, then there's a transition going on, and all these other things move. 
And this kind of animation seemed to be really hard to fit in an FRP structured program. Um, I, I tried something where it was, so I, I had my pure code and my pure calculation of the, out, of the resulting, I guess, col um, collage would be the term. So I also have a collage um, data type. And then I was diffing the two to collages to understand, okay, now something has moved to a different place and I can animate that. And that kind of worked, but it's, it also only got, got me so far. And one of the problems is that it doesn't, it's not enough to just know that, um, that for example, um, let's, um, let's connect this twice. So from, from this state to this state, I mean, I've said something twice, so let's actually change the state, but I still want to animate something. So it's not just enough to know um, what it should look like before and after, but also you have to know why it now has changed because you want to do different animations for different things. And, and this was like, and, um, I mean, I, I wasn't, I'm not very fluent at the whole reflex FRP thing. So I really struggled to get this in. And I, at some point I, I gave up and I switched back to just using IO refs um, for like my game state, another IO ref for the state of, of managing the, um, the presentation, so to say, like the layout, another IO ref to manage the state of the drag and drop feature, which is, should be, which the, rather, the rest shouldn't see. And some state machines, and, and I have a module called Melee Automaton. So now it's working. I'm not happy with that spaghetti code. Uh, but I think now that I've actually went to the exercise and implemented what I really want in this kind of pedestrian style, maybe I can now come go back and think how to do this in this nice function reactive programming style. I haven't gotten around to do that yet. Um, but yeah, that was a bit. I found it slightly dis disappointing that. FRP got more in the way than it was helping in, in my case. But this might just be, you know, just like when you're a fresh Haskell programmer and, and you want to use imperative programming style, it just takes a while to get used to, to that way of thinking. Um, what's cool with Reflex is it's not just this FRP library, but also this ecosystem of building stuff, and this allows me to cross compile the whole thing to Android. So I hope I can put something on a Play Store soon, just because it's fun to put stuff in the Play Store. Um, the template Haskell issue got fixed over lunch, so I can build again. <laughs> and, um, right. So this is, I think, everything I want to say about implementation. I thought about like showing you the code of the way I structure these things and these automatons and the way I do the separation between the pure game logic, which deals <coughs> in terms of abstract positions. So there's the big one and the many small ones, and then a layer that just the layout and animation, and another layer that takes care of drag and drop. It shouldn't affect the layout. Um, but since I'm not that confident that it's that good yet, uh, I'll skip that. But if you have questions, you can um, come to me afterwards or during the question session. Um, yeah, final thoughts. Um, this is the game. Have fun. Um, I hope <laughs> now that you know how to use it, you <laughs> can enjoy it. Um, one problem that I have with this game is it's like it's open-ended. I don't know how much when when would I stop stop twiddling with it and fiddling and changing some algorithm, changing the randomization and things. Um, and then there are big ideas like I could make these things animated. I mean, it's WebGL already. It's really I'm rendering every frame anyway. It should be super easy to to have fancy animations where these patterns just like evolve and open in, in front of you. But when do I stop? Um, like usually at the end of the day, and then there's nothing for a few weeks. But I guess let's just call it done at some point. Um, colors are hard for people like me who don't have a good sense of aesthetics for colors. So the current color set, so there's six basic colors. They don't, they're more mixed, they're more blend. Um, was contributed by a friend of mine who had a better sense of colors before I just took the color wheel and had six, like, uh, six, six equidistant uh, basic colors and that was a bit stark in the contrast. Um, UI design is hard, like I could give this to people and maybe two thirds figure out how to use it uh, on, without help. But I really would like to not have a tutorial mode. So how do I make this UI self-explanatory? It's, it's a tricky art. Um, probably in this audience, there are many people who are better at this than I am. Um, UI implementation is hard, but we've just said that uh, in the last talk. And since I have Android and uh, SDL, I wonder if I actually need this whole WebGL um, who to build it on Android, but cross compilation SDL to Android is a bit hard, so maybe that's a technical point. Um, that being said, um, I would be happy to collaborate with anybody who thinks it's a nice little toy project and um, 
can contribute in any of these or any other way. Um, and if not, I'm just happy people enjoy it and have fun. So uh, thank you. So the STL version is still just more or less an experiment. Okay, so maybe cool. I just did a shot, took a shortcut there. Um, but yeah, this is a good point. So many of like um, many nice abstract ways of structuring these things break down when you have a requirement that um, if you've seen the same pattern before in the last frame, you want to reuse an existing cached compiled version of the thing. So you know you have this data dependency where it's not just a function of the input, but really a function of the input, and you somehow either want to have a map where you memorize things or you want to explicitly know when you can uh, free one of these patterns. So there are some, yeah, so things are often not as pretty as I think they are initially. Um, oh, yeah, okay. you can speak. Oh, uh, yes, in the back. Uh, more comment on the question. Uh, so there's a library called called Wine that builds from here to come up state machines that might help you with some of your problems. Okay. But what I want to say, so what to ask is, um, could you also just take your uh, these genomes for your for, for these patterns and mutate them slightly, or even mutate them continuously, like mutate the color, whatnot, the angles, stuff, and, and then have little yeah videos or, or one transformation turning into the other. Yes. Yes. I I, I thought about that. Um, because of this abstraction mismatch between crossbreeding and and uh, the way I, I generate the picture, I think at the moment it's hard because there's not an immediate visual correspondence, at least not a continuous visual correspondence between the change during the genomes. This would have been easier in the first version where I was doing things like combining trees. Um, but it, it would improve the game if you could see more the connection between what you get out of the two parents and, and what they are. So one of these, yeah, definitely is fun thing to explore. I guess you get uh, we'll, we'll go in order, so you, you were first. Um, well, when I see um, symbols or pictures like this, uh, and then when I see um, some some long hexadecimal number, <coughs> numbers, I always think about uh, Sort of like a representation, visual representation of, uh, let's say, check sounds, uh, <laughs> things like that. And so, um, do you have any, any any patterns? For example, in my phone, I have uh, hundreds of contacts, and well, there is some sort of like a circle, and everything starts with A for numbers for for people starting with names starting with A's. Do you have any any sort of like potential usage for for things like that, like representing? representation of numbers with graphical symbols right. just to make it easy for people? Uh, it's a cool idea. I didn't think about this. I mean, obviously, there are existing um, examples for that, some auto-generated GitHub um, yeah, yeah, yeah. icons. Um, also, SSH has the text textual representation of yeah. um, of key hashes that is like a blob of ASCII art. Um, obviously, the requirements are a bit different. So here, you can, you can have many different strings that have the same picture. For example, if you have a red sphere and you rotate it, it's still a red sphere. Um, or if you have two colors, but you only have one space to put a color in, then the second color is not visible. So I think for that thing, you want to optimize for different things. So you could maybe take some of the combinators, but I think, I think the requ requirements are different. So I don't think you can use this directly. I don't think the things you would use for that use case, I don't think they're necessarily good for this particular variant of the game. Because <laughs> well, maybe they are. Well, like you, here, here you want to have continuity, continuity between similar things, whereas in the hash recognition you want s almost equal hashes to be very visibly different. Because then you want to. You hash it first and then run this thing. Right. On the result of the hash. Then you. Then similar things would. Then the collisions would be not a problem. That's true. Yeah. 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 I guess I could. That, that's a good point. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, did you still have a I just want to know, how do I save, save this cool picture I made without losing the game state? Uh, oh, <laughs> you can't. Well, you can save the picture itself using the save button. I hope it works for you. 
Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, no, he has a picture. Yeah, but then if I go back, the game says it's gone, right? Uh, okay, that depends Open on your browser. Like in, in other, <laughs> no, it's, it's like in other browsers you get a save. Like if I do this here, um, I get a, a save icon. I can just yeah. No, it. on Safari it just opens in the, as a thing, and then I oh, get okay. back. Oh, okay. I didn't. Yeah, sorry, I didn't test the Safari. But um, <laughs> I guess there's another question oh. there. <laughs> now I'm disappointed. There's another question <laughs> there, I guess, which is, can you save the state and can come back? And and no, I actually wanted this to be a thermal, so you. You create these nice things, and okay, you can save one, but really the overall thing is something that just disappears. And yeah, I guess it's artistic freedom to say like this is the way it should be. Like a Zen garden, the whole point. Is. Yes, yes. I mean, th there are some Zen aspects to it, to like, just keep looking at these things and decide, I like this, I don't like this, this is nice. Yeah. Have you ever gotten to the same state? Yeah. So you, I'm not sure if I would notice because often you don't really remember which ones you already did. So if you do the same thing again, um, well, you obviously get to the same state. So every every pair of two is deterministic. You can't just keep retrying the same pattern and get different results because that would just be bad gameplay. Uh, in, in contrast to real life, where you keep trying with the same and then you get different and it's fun. Eventually, you get a, eventually you get a child that you like. Yes, yes, and then you get rid of the old ones. Like that's this button. Um, um, I got too real. It, I think it could happen. Um, I don't know what, how probable it is. I, it wouldn't be horrible if it happens. So in this case, I didn't think about it much. Yeah. When describing the combination rules, you said like randomly does this and that. I guess it's deterministic. So right. I guess it's similar to the random, but I couldn't talk a bit more about what you were doing. Good point. Yeah. So what I do is. If I have these two um, two genomes, um, first I s sort them by their hash. So this may they doesn't matter in which order you you select the two. And then I basically take a hash of the two, and that's the seed of my random number generator. So that for the same pair, I always get the same result. But in the algorithm where I do this kind of um, crossbreeding, I have randomness available, but it'll still always give the same. And if you reload the whole game, it'll fix a new global seed. So within one game session, um, these two will always yield this one. But if you reload, then you'll get something else here. Which is important because you'll start with the same six. So you really want to have different combinations the second time you, you play the game. And I, I guess it's a way of you know, saying Haskell's great because you can nicely contain these side effects like randomness. Um, and it's, it's very natural to do in Haskell. I should ask, did we have any Slido? Nope. <laughs> okay. Good. Any other questions from the audience? All right. Well, then let's. Was that, was that one or? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, well, I did have a question. I was just I, purely about the JavaScript generation, which I've seen for. I mean, WebAssembler now is the trendy thing in the web community and something. So, is there, this is purely just a Haskell question. Is there work to build a WebAssembler? There's like more, than, more than one project to um, Asterios. Uh, funded and run by Tweak, and there is um, WebGHA, which I think is more of a hobbyist project. They have different approaches to how they where they plug into the pipeline. So we'll see which one is going to be the text fault. In this case, the, the main problem of Web um, WebAssembly at the moment is that it's hard. To, like you still have to do lots of manual work to actually interact with the DOM and the browser. So WebAssembly is this sandbox, and it doesn't actually know anything about the web. So the, there's this this idiom that's saying it's. WebAssembly is neither web nor assembly, and, and that's true. Um, but you can render a shader directly in WebAssembly, though, right? So you could generate them and then just have to communicate with the DOM once you with your output. Right, but even then, I don't think WebAssembly implementing shaders would beat performance of uh, WebGL compiled shader. Right, but, but, um, but they have a Vulkan variant or whatever it is now, which is a WebGL. I mean, it's not on the main line yet, but that would allow you to do that. That's what I'm saying. So you can call natively from WebAssembly to you know, the new so, would, so it would replace the, um, the, web, um, the shader code here with um, WebAssembly code. And then that runs on the graphic right. card. Right, yeah. Um, no, oh. no, 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 you just generate GS. I mean, it's just GSL, right? Right. So, yeah, so you could generate that. But then there's native calls in WebAssembly that will allow you to have the pipeline exposed. So you wouldn't have to go back. Oh, but I, I guess because it's just one canvas, I mean, only WebGL, I think there's much to be gained in terms mm -hmm. of performance. I, I, I think maybe, maybe profiling would tell me different. Okay. Thank you. All right. Stay